डॉटिंग है लॉज बट इट जोरस डे टू कम बिफोर यू दिस मॉर्निंग टू हैव दिस ऑपरेशनिटी टू ब्रा इन योर वे व्हाट इट ब्लेस मी दिस may we be assured in your way we will learn about how to apply your way in our daily lives for as we look to be sharpened as we look to be transformed by a gospel of grace the kind of gospel that can only be received in faith alone i ask that you grant us wisdom and boldness in how to walk in grace i thank you father Even to this day we can testify of your goodness and mercy that is everlasting. I pray as a servant Lord help me help me to deliver your word. Help me to live to deliver your gospel the way we want it to be heard. Not according to how I want it to be heard but according to how you want it to be heard to your people Father. Let it walk through to their ears and their hearts and make it different and change them and transform them to the Christ alone. I ask this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. <laughs> This is indeed the high point of our worship. As Pastor always say, you can see the lights. Camera. <laughs> So I'm the center of attention now. <laughs> That's why it's only never speak it to be a terrorist. <laughs> uh, but the gift said you always teach you teach in the Bible that you teach at you. But this point here is different than that. But it's for the Lord and I pray that God gives me the strength to deliver this message to you loud and clear. that it may transform you. It's all about me. So for me, remember over the last three months, there's been a while, I know, I would remind you that we just through the book of Galatians from verse 1, from chapter 1, verses 1 to 9, in which we have seen how determined the Apostle Paul defended his apostleship, which he received not from men, nor through men, but revealed directly from Jesus Christ the God the Father that's why not only did he defended his apostleship in addition he defended the gospel the junior gospel the true gospel which is the gospel of grace which he received by faith alone this gospel was under attack by by Jewish religious by four teachers Their mission was to denounce Paul's authority. Their mission was to denounce the gospel that Paul is bringing to the Gentiles. And so that no one had to believe Paul. They were aiding Judaizing activities to this gospel. Although they believed in the Son Jesus Christ, they believed in the resurrection, they believed in salvation. Their only difference is that for them to be saved you need to come to Christ and present yourself in a different way which is what so paul has defended this attack from this Jews, from this false leaders as we remember from galatians 3 it says all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse this curse is that word anathema it separates you from Christ it separates you from the presence of God this is the big issue for me this is the battle that Paul was in and it's the same battle that we find ourselves today that we can fight as well because this is still happening in our day in our daily age where we see people coming and distort the gospel and today we'll continue from verses 10 to 24 in Galatians 1 verses 10 to 24 tell with me to the Galatians 1 10 to 24 and let's read together i'll read for I, for am i now seeking the approval of men or of god 
Or am I trying to, to please men? If I was still trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. Verse 11. For I will have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. It, for you have heard of my former life in Judea, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judea, beyond many of my old age among my people, so extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. But when he who had set me apart in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles. So, but he set me apart, I was born, before I was born, and who called me by his grace, verse 16, was pleased to reveal his son to, to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles. I did not need to consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I went away into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Verse 18. Then after three years, I went up to the Jerusalem to visit Cephas and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. In what I'm writing to you before God, I do not lie. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Syria, and I was still unknown in person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only were hearing and said, He who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they will find out because of me. Family, I decided I decide to title my sermon Defending the Gospel of Grace through your testimony. Defending the gospel of the grace through your testimony. This part of this part of the epistle is called autobiographical section. Autobiographical section simply means when dealing with one's writer's own life. See with me, verse 10. For I will have no verse 11. For I'll Verse 10, for am I now seeking the approval of men? 11, for I will have you know. 12, for I did not receive it from any man. 13, for you have heard of my former life. 14, and I was advancing in Judaism. 16, B, I, that I might preach him among the Gentiles. 17, now did I go to Jerusalem? 18. Then after three years, I went to I went up to Jerusalem. What I'm trying to establish here the case is that Paul is the subject in this context. He speaks about his life. He shares to us his testimony. What is this testimony that Paul is sharing to us? He talks about the efficacy of the gospel in his life. He's saying to us, you can believe I'm a pastor. Because it's originated not from man, not from man, but from Christ. It's been revealed from Christ directly. And God the Father. And therefore you can believe this gospel that I'm preaching to you. That is because it's divine. So Paul is speaking about his testimony. But it's not the first time he shares his testimony. We hear also about his testimony in the book of Acts, in the book of Acts 22. Also, the book of Acts 26, 4 to 23, you can read it at home. We find out him talking about his own conversion and experiences. This is not, however, what we will see in his testimony is not the general inspiration or pointing us to himself, as people will do. We will share about testimonies about our own pride. We will share testimonies about our own happiness. But Paul here, he does it differently. He does it to refute the claims of people who want to undermine his message. 
and he went all point to the God of amazing grace. Passing to four, he says, and they glorified God because of me, because of the kind of testimony that he brought, they glorified God. His testimony is not about himself. It is important to share our testimony. Also, for us, it's important. Remember, just a month ago, uh, we had a baptism here. We were blessed to have a baptism, and when the people will come to be baptized, people will ask, Pastor will ask that one question, that unique question, share your testimony. And they will share their testimony before they are baptized. Why is that? They share their testimony so that the church members, they can believe and see the impact of the gospel in their lives and how that gospel has transformed them to this point of life in their life where they're now being baptized. It's the same to us, family. The testimony that we are to share, we are to share about God, showing the impact and how this gospel has transformed us. Therefore, we will see how Paul introduces to his testimony. That is verses 10 to 12. We will see how Paul lived outside grace from verses 13 to 14. And we will see how he lived through grace. Lastly, we will see how he lived in grace from verses 18 to 24. Let's go to the first part. <coughs> Let's see how he introduces to this testimony. Verses 10 to 11 to 12. That is, for am I now seeking the approval of men or of God? Or am I trying to please men? If I, was trying to, if I was still trying to please men, I will not be a servant of Christ. He begins with an explanation responding to his critics, starting with the word for. You know, in English, you cannot start a sentence with the word for. So he's referring us to the previous verses where he said, anyone who preached the, any gospel contrary to what was preached, let it be a case. So that is in verse 9, we see. But here Paul is, is preaching that any man, that this gospel that he received is not one that he received from any man, nor three men, but it's the one that is received from Jesus Christ directly. We still see how he continues to defend this, this, this idea that he received this gospel directly from Jesus Christ in verses 11 and 12. What Paul is saying is that this kind of gospel, the one which is divine, it removes a man pleasing spirit. It takes away the drive to win approval of man. Mm. He is not seeking human approval mm. as the religious leaders attempt to. He points and he mentioned that he could not be a servant of Christ if he was a man pleaser. As Christians, you cannot please both men and God at the same time. Mm -hmm. You cannot. It's impossible. If you're going to be a true servant of Christ, you need to break every barrier of men pleasing. In Proverbs 9 and 5, I'll read it to you. It says, The fear of man lays a snare. But whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. The fear here projected to man is the one that is directly opposite to fear of God. In Old Testament, when they speak of fear of God, when it talks about David talks about it as the one, not the one that is terrified or being frightened. He talks about the one who who is filled with awe, the one who is filled with wonder at His majesty and his greatness. However, the fear of man reveals to a view of a particular person. It can be your boss at work, it can be your pastor at church, it can be your parent at home, or it can be your wife. <laughs> That's not like saying married men are afraid of their wives. You elevate their importance you hold them in awe. 
you fear them screw up. In other ways, you desire their blessings. That desire of their blessings amounts to worship. So you worship them. You may not take this life if you may be. This is dangerous. Remember when Saul disobeyed God in 1 Samuel. Let us read together. 1 Samuel 15. 1 Samuel 15. From 24. Psalm 1524. I read. Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed, transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your will, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now therefore, said to Samuel, said, Now therefore, please pardon my spirit and return with me that I may bow before the Lord. And someone said to Saul, I will not tell you with you, for you have rejected the way of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. This is dangerous. Saul lost his kingship because of the public opinion. He cares about the public opinion. What will people say? This kind of fear will cut you out of God's blessings. Paul urges Christians here to obey God because this is pleasing to God. Paul mentions another common way in Ephesians, also what Brother Gab and his wife in prayer from 5, but I'll, I'll read the Ephesians 6 from verse 6 where he talks about the eye service. From verse 6 to 7, not by the way of eye service as people give us. But as born servant of Christ, doing the will of God from their heart, rendering service with good will as to the Lord and not men. You do your job, do it as unto the Lord. When you serve in church, do it as unto the Lord. Not you want to please pastor or you want to please the Holy Ghost. Whatever that you do, do it as unto the Lord. Always it must point out to God for His glory alone. Amen. 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 Fearing God and trusting His gospel will give you the complete favor and boldness and confidence to please Him. So what we see is that Paul seeks to please God and he does so by preaching this gospel. He testifies the impact of his experiences before conversion. And this is what we see from our second point, how we lived outside the grace. Verse 13 to 14. Verse 13 to 14, now read. For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism before many of my age among my people. So, so it's in New Zealand, rather, I saw the traditions of my fathers. He tried to destroy the gospel and so believe in it. That's the amazing thing. This is the man who killed and murdered Christians and prisoned them, the innocent ones. He violently opposed Christ that even watching Christians being killed and stoned to death in front of him had no effect on him. You see in Acts 7, where Stephen was, was stoned to death in front of him and had no effect on him. He so hated the Christians. Imagine people watching this horrible act. They were probably scared of their lives at the cost of preaching the gospel. And probably asking, where is God that is be preaching in all this? Paul was filled with hatred. He hated Christians with all his being. He says he has beaten almost everyone of his own age at being extremely zealous for the tradition of his fathers. He's talking about religious traditions. 
He's talking about Jewish customs. He was extremely zealous. He was bad. He obeyed all the traditions. He was a good keeper of all the traditions. He became to us that despite all this, he was saved by grace. All amazing grace is. Based the unmerited favor of God. He was saved by Christ alone. And he was called to be a leader of the faith. Such gospel can make it is not a religion. That's simply understood. This gospel calls out religion as much as it calls out a religion. I can further say Christianity is not a religion. Christianity is got to it's a relationship that has got to do with the one with whom we identify ourselves, which is Jesus Christ. Though Paul's sins were very deep, he was invited into the grace, the amazing grace of God. What am I saying to you as the gospel? There is no greater sins that can stop you to receive this salvation. You've got the opportunity today to come just as you are and to be saved by faith alone. You're not guaranteed of tomorrow. What I'm saying is that there is no one who's so good that they do not need the grace of God. No, so one that is so bad that they cannot receive the grace of God. See, as Louis said, Christianity must be from God. For who else would have thought it out? Paul looked back and recognizes that God's very grace was working in his life all along before his conversion. He looks back and we see how he lived in this life through grace from verses 15 to 17. But when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles. I did not need to consult with anyone, and did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were the apostles before me. But I went away to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Paul uses this notion God set me apart before I was born and called by his grace. This is the same, he quotes these exact words from. What was given to the great prophet Jeremiah in verse one, in chapter one, from four to five, when God said, "The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you." That word consecration it means to be set apart. This is what Paul is, is quoting in his life that he has been set apart before he even knew himself. That's the amazing grace of God. What Paul is saying is that the grace of God had been shaping him and molding him and transforming him all his life for this greater purpose to preach the gospel among the Gentiles. But this is the major theme in the Bible, isn't it? We remember back, I don't know how long it is, it's been quite a while when Pastor preached about Genesis, the book of Genesis about Joseph. Remember when Joseph came to his brothers and when he was happy to share his dreams and the brothers hated him and they wanted to stop this dream of God that is implanted in Joseph. But they could not. We see also when apostles were preaching the gospel and had, had oppositions to stop it, but it continued to grow and grow and grow. We see also now, Saul, now called Paul, also wanted to destroy God's kingdom, but it continued to grow and eventually changing him. He did not know that God is in sovereign had orchestrated all things for his glory. What I'm saying is that what God, what is of God cannot be destroyed. Oppositions will always be there, maybe. Are also in part of our lives. But are for God's prayer. What we know from the well known verse that Romans 8 12 says, For we know that for those who love God, all things work together 
for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Even in our own lives, there will be oppositions, but they should not stop us from worshiping him. They should not stop us from saving him. My question to you as a believer, since you have been called by this grace, just like Paul has been called by this grace, what is your, what are you doing about this salvation? What are you doing about this call that you have responded? Are you doing, are you preaching the gospel both? Are you going out and preach this gospel? Are you defending this gospel when they speak evil of it? Or you just stand and say, I do not want to put myself in a different way. It says that it pleases God to reveal his son to me. Not because Paul deserved it. Paul, in fact, he least deserved to, to get this gospel according to his conversion experiences. But it is because it pleased God. God revealed the Christ in Paul's life that he might preach him. In other words, Paul was called to show Jesus through his life. Can you see Christ in your life? Can you see Jesus in your life today? Can you see that God's selection has got nothing to do with your former life, how you have lived. It's got nothing to do with how you presented yourself. Even Moses tells us, we hear from Moses when he tells the God's people, Israel, in chapter 27, when he says, it's not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you for you were the fewest of all peoples, but it's because of the Lord's love. God, in his sovereignty, he does so because he loves us. God does not love us because we are serious and what to do. He simply does so because he loves us. We can be can now be sure and secure about this love that God has, has for us, that we cannot lose his grace. And we are we, are, we hear that we do not immediately consult it with any flesh. We are sure that the gospel that came to Paul is directly from Jesus Christ. He did not learn it from the apostles. He did not go to them and consulted with them about this gospel after his salvation. But he said he went away. But we know from the book of Acts 9 and 5, it tells us the reason why he actually went away, because they plotted to keep him there after he preached the gospel in the synagogues. This brings to me to how he lived in grace. Let's see it together from verses 18 to 24. How he lived this gospel in grace. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. In what I'm writing to you before God, I do not lie. Then I went into the regions of Syria, of Syria and Syria, and I was still unknown in person to the churches of Judea that I in Christ. There only were hearing said, He who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy, and they glorified God because of me. Fellowship. Let's see. From, instead of then after three years, I went up to the Jerusalem. How many years did Jesus spend with his disciples? Three years. Paul spent time away for three years as well, just as for Timothy. But it says he went after three years, he went to Jerusalem to visit Cephas and remained with him 15 days. And so other than, but I saw none of the other apostles except James, the lost brother. What Paul is saying is that after three years, he went to be united with Cephas, which is Peter. He went to be, to want to know Cephas. 
But we can go we here and we are honored by the brother visited us to preach on us to preach his book of Galatians. But he preached on Galatians 3. He talked about fellowship in Christ. I was happy that he talked about fellowship because family, the book of Galatians, the whole thing in its theme is about the heart of the gospel, which is justification by faith alone and not by obedience of the law. That we cannot miss that there is fellowship to this gospel. The gospel brings us to fellowship with Christ. This gospel brings us into fellowship with one another. The idea is that there is no gospel without fellowship. Mm -hmm. You will hear people saying, I will preach my God alone, or I will attend church alone at home, seated and watching online service, reading. Let me show you my testimony. Before I came here, back in COVID times, 2020, during the pandemic COVID, uh, my former church at one point, they closed the doors because they had a big number a big number, so they could not continue with the church. And now they had to move to their online services. And so we watch services at home in church. But my spirit was not supported. So I decided to call, pick up a call and inquired. And I called pastor and I inquired, are you guys open there? Are you guys operating? And he said, yes, we are open and we are operating. And I said, I'll come there to fellowship. Looking to come here to fellowship for only that period of time. And look at me now. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. Fellowship is important for me. Paul, after three years, he went to Jerusalem looking to be acquainted with his brother. He understood the importance of fellowship to be united with the ones he shared the gospel with. He understood his importance. But what we do now is that people, they share the same belief, but they compete amongst each other. Pastor also mentioned that churches now, they are, people idolize these churches. They say, my church is the better one. My church is the place to be. And we forget the greater purpose that we're here for, <coughs> to preach the gospel. That we can share this gospel and preach together and reach out to people. In verses 21, from verses 21, it says that then I went into the regions of Syria and Syria, and I was still unknown in person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They were only hearing said, He went to be planted in the church. Not only that, but also saving. He was preaching. And this is how they got to hear about this testimony. He who used to persecute us, churches of Christ, is now preaching the faith he was trying to destroy and glorify God because of me. As Christians, we must be planted in the church. We must be planted in a local church. It's important. You must fellowship with one another. You must be a true servant of Christ. What I'm saying is that such Christian life, it's rooted in a church relationship with Christ mm. and in unity with and services of other believers leads to praises to God and glorify God. Mm -hmm. Family, what is your story? What is your testimony? Is God glorified in your testimony? Will God be honored and be praised in your testimony? Please understand that you're encouraged to share, be vulnerable, and speak about the personal life of what gospel means to you. When you go out there, you don't speak about your testimony that reveals your, your pride. You share, you share your testimony that is helpful to others, not about your pride or self gain. You share the testimony that will not cloud the gospel. Mm -hmm. Share your testimony about the efficacy of the gospel. Mm -hmm. 
be failing this only gospel that God has called us to. Mm. Let's pray. Mm. Heavenly Father, thank you for a gospel that will transform us, Lord. Mm. Thank you for this gospel that brings to salvation. Lord, as a church, we believe that we still believe that the gospel will change and transform and save those who are not saved amongst us. We pray that your teachings, Father, may not be in vain. That they leave us, that they live in us and mature us into the image of your Christ. Lord, we thank you for what the gospel has done in our lives. May we not stay here after receiving, after having received this gospel and sit with our, in our homes comfortably. But we have a task, we have a mission to go out there and preach the gospel and share to them what you have done in our lives. Mm -hmm. Give us the courage and boldness to do so. I thank you, Lord, for all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you, Kennedy.